I will never get used to doing these things all by ourselves. <clears throat> so, Sashi Delek, and welcome to the Sutra project. <laughs> I'm so happy that we are finally doing this. <clears throat> um, this has been um, a dream for such a long time. Um, to dedicate um, a study program specifically um, for the sutra section of Buddha's teaching. Of course, we have um, talked about sutras before too, <clears throat> but um, they were just individual teachings and um, so this is a good start. It's a really good start and it's a really good day. Today is um, Chuntul Tichen. So the day of miraculous display, you know, it's a <clears throat> very special um, day for Buddhists all over the world. Uh, today marks um, this, the beginning of um, two week long, you know, continuous miraculous displays that Shakyamuni Buddha um, manifested for the benefit of sentient beings. And um, yeah, so what better way to um, celebrate this day than to remember the Buddha and um, go through his teachings. <clears throat> also, it is, I think today is, um, anniversary of many great masters, Indians and Tibetan masters like Marpa Lotzawa and so on. So the, um, how to say, yeah, that's such a happy um, gathering. <clears throat> Before we go into this text, I um, would like to request you to um, all of us to spend some moment in the recollection of the Buddha. So the meditation is quite simple. We <clears throat> visualize um, Shakyamuni Buddha in front of us. under a Bodhi tree. Um, um, seated on a seat made of kusha grass with his right hand touching the earth and his left hand in meditation posture. His gaze fixed on you, each one of us. And there is a faint smile on his face and his entire being is engulfed in engulfed in this um, light just that and you 
seated in front of him. And the meditation is simple. You just, you just look at the Buddha. <laughs> you just look at the Buddha and just admire, admire the, <clears throat> um, admire the appearance of the Buddha, his face, eyes, nose, hair, you know, arms, shoulder, hands, everything, just watch mm, that. That's very simple meditation. Please start. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> now the reason why we want we've been wanting to learn sutra with you for such a long time is um, because sadly, um, uh, no, nobody's really learning anything from the sutras, at least those who belong to the Tibetan tradition, Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Um, Maybe we are reading Heart Sutra or the Diamond Katra Sutra, like one or two. But the majority of Buddha's teaching um, is just um, not, not really read, not really studied and contemplated upon. <clears throat> um, there is a good reason how this happened. There is a, actually, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, the Tibetans, <clears throat> they thought that um, um, the sutras are not um, worthy of our time, you know, the masters, and they, <clears throat> excuse me, there is something going on.
Takangi in a yoga machia, Tayusha. It's not like the Tibetans didn't think that the sutras were important enough. It's just that um, Indian masters like um, Chandrakirti um, uh, <clears throat> have insisted the importance of relying on a realized being, realized master, someone who has seen the emptiness directly someone who is who has at least reached the first bhumi you know for the interpretations of the sutra um chandrakirti in his own way insists that he um, um the, he um, has based his entire work um, on the teachings of nagarjuna for example and this is a really good reason too, to be able to uh, extract, uh, to be able to extract and form a philosophical school, you know, to be able to understand the teachings of the Buddha by oneself without depending on anyone else. For that, you have to have, you have to be a Bodhisattva on Bhumis. That is true. That is also mentioned that until you reach the first bumi, you have to depend upon others to understand the um, teachings of the Buddhas, teachings of the Buddha. You know, you cannot sort of um, um, form an entire um, um, view path and conduct or view meditation and conduct by yourself, by reading sutras. It doesn't matter however learned you are, you have to depend on a realized being for, for good reason. And this was also important in Tibet, you know, um, when Buddha Dhamma first came to Tibet and slowly, slowly um, they begin to develop different schools. So it was important that um, all of the Tibetan schools um, refer to the same realized masters like Nagarjuna and Asanga and Chandrakirti and Dharmakirti. And that was really, really useful. That being said, um, the more the, Tibet, we, we, um, the Tibetans depended upon the Shastras. So Shastra means um, the um, commentaries of the sutras, comment commentaries of the Buddha's teachings, shastras. So, you know, texts written by the great Indian masters, for example. So the more Tibetans, they relied upon the shastras. Um, ideally, what we should have had done was that we should have studied both shastras and the um, sutras, but we didn't do that. Uh, sadly, you know, <laughs> throughout in the beginning, yes, you know, as you can see, um, the beginning uh, earlier Tibetan masters have written so many commentaries of the sutras, and they have taught so many sutras and so on. But gradually, through the centuries, we began to rely completely on the uh, works of Indian masters and less and less and less on Buddha. And this, I must admit, has um, uh, created quite a distance uh, among many ordinary practitioners and Shakyamuni Buddha, you know, of, of all the people, <laughs> Shakyamuni Buddha. Um, and that's, that's really, that's, that's not good. So, um, <clears throat> masters have warned us throughout, um, you know, um, history of Tibetan Buddhism, especially, for example, recently, His, His Holiness Dalai Lama, he's been, um, um, he's been teaching about this openly, saying that we really, really need to go back to our roots. Also, we really need to um, 
pay attention to the life of the Buddha and the direct teachings of the Buddha, you know. And um, other masters like Chabji, um, you know, he is probably mm, the loudest voice in this regard, in this direction, you know, um, not only um, under his patronage, um, <clears throat> we, um, um, the entire teachings of the Buddhas are being translated. He himself is actively giving teachings on the Sutra. This is so rare. I really hope you, you realize that. This is so rare. Um, so, um, So from our own side, from my side, this is our attempt to contribute to that, to, to that movement of going back to the sutras. And yeah, I'm so happy that you decided to take part in it. And well, this is sutra teaching. So how much can I mess it up? You know, so it's, you know it's already written here. So, so um, yeah, that being said, I hope all of you have the translations. The English translation, uh, it, it's, you know, it's from 84,000. Uh, Kinsir which is um, basically a um, translation project. <clears throat> mm, and then we also have translations in other languages. So please ask your translators. Reading sutras, um, it will not only create a direct link between you and the enlightened one, Shakyamuni Buddha. Um, you will also know, um, learn a lot about the life of the Buddha lot about the life of his um, enlightened disciples. You know, you will also know about Buddha's, I, I don't want to say his demeanor, but his, I also don't want to say his habits, but just, just how was he as a person? You know, <laughs> it's so precious. Um, this will definitely help you, um, help us generate devotion. That's needless to say, you know, more you read Sutra, more you contemplate on Sutra, you will get closer and closer and closer to Buddha. Um, there is no need to, to say that your, your um, devotion will grow and you will have clarity, clarity of mind, clarity um, in conviction about the teachings of the Buddha, about the realities, about your potential capacity, and you will become confident in your practice. And wow, so, so many things to gain by mere reading of Sutra, mere study and contemplation of Sutra. Um, and you will gain merit, of course, immense merit. Wow, us reading this sutra today is prolonging the life of this sutra, the prolonging the teaching of Buddha to remain on this earth. A little bit longer, a little bit longer, you know, we're really pushing it. It's so much merit, it's really, um, 
it is it is an act of immense merit i want you to know that um i think it was atisha who said this he when he was in tibet uh, you know originally atisha was invited to when he was invited to tibet the indian king made him promise to return after 3 years you know india really needed atisha at that time to be honest it was kind of unfair you know that the tibetans you know um, sort of got the great atisha to come to tibet but atisha had no choice um, the former king of tibet gave up his life so that atisha can come to tibet so atisha had no choice but to come he was only going to say 3 years but then uh, after the 3 years had passed there was a war on the border so he couldn't go back to india all in all he spent um, i think a lot of i think like 12 13 years in tibet and during those times he couldn't read um, a lot of sutras and he definitely couldn't read a new you know other sutras that he hadn't read, read before so he he said oh you know since i came to tibet i haven't been able to read a lot of sutras and i can feel my devotion to a sakyamuni diminishing you know <laughs> getting i have to say yeah so obviously you know it would be bizarre to even imagine that atisha's devotion to a sakyamuni can even diminish but i think it was a very important teaching for us for the tibetans and the followers of um these tibetan traditions that we really really need to pay attention to buddha's teachings um and we really need to generate devotion devotion not just because he is the buddha or he is an enlightened being but devotion by knowing his teaching by knowing his aspiration his and his effort you know um <clears throat> right so without right where are we so the sutra um, it starts with this um dige thage to be teaching na um thus have i heard at one time thus did i hear at one time so now recently some translators um they want to translate it like this so that's what we have here thus did i hear at one time the bhagavan was dwelling in anatha pindata's uh, park in the jeta grove in stravasti um, along in in shravasti along with the large monastic assembly so this is the layout it is the con- this is the context of the sutra mm, and you will notice that all the sutras of the buddha will begin like this you know the sapa had a this did i hear at one time the bhagavan was dwelling in this and that place with the this and that um disciple <clears throat> or assembly um so this is important in so many our teachers tell us that this shows five um different things <clears throat> it shows the place the place is in jetavana in jeta groove um or um, how to say the place is anatha Pin- pindata's park it is a park inside a forest the forest belongs to a Uh, belonged to a prince prince sorry prince named jeta 
so um anatha pin anatha pindika or here we have anatha pin pindata he bought um a piece of land a piece of that forest and offered it to the buddha and he built um a huge um um you know monastic settlement there for the buddhas and his for the buddha and his retinue to to stay and they, they they had everything they had temple they had bath they had you know um residence of the of the monks and like that so it was um one of the first buddhist monastic sort of i don't know if i could even say institution like you know basically a monastery of india one of the first and this is it and this is also a very very important monastery um because buddha uh, you know we believe that um but some say he buddha spent at least 18 years there so, uh, some some say 20 or more than that so whatever the case he seemed to have spent a long time in this place and most of the vinaya teachings of the buddha most of the initial fundamental teachings of buddha dharma was given in this um in this place in this um, sort of dwelling monastery you know so it's a very important place and how they this place came to be is also um you know um anatha pindika or anatha pindata so i'm so used to saying anatha pindika it's a bit takes time for me to say anatha pindata so this is the name of a very rich merchant and when he came to buddha with full of devotion and he wanted to become a monk and buddha refused saying no you must you must do business you must be an example and you must support uh, the monastics with your profit so that's what he did so um uh one way of supporting the monastics he understood is that um they need a dwelling they need a they need a place so he went around all over the kingdom and finally he saw that the prince's um forest this forest that, that belong to the prince there is a there is a place which is perfect to build um you know um dwelling for the buddha and his monks it was not too far from the cities and the villages so that they can easily go to beg for food and the people can also easily come for teachings but it was far enough that it was very quiet you know so it was perfect um when he asked the prince the prince was not at all willing to sell it he said no i, I don't want to sell it and another pinta this please you must i must have this place at you know no matter what the cost so the prince just jokingly said oh if you lay down enough gold coin to cover the entire earth of this place i will sell it to you you know and anatha pindika came with a bullock cart you know kid sort of bullock carts full of gold coin and started laying them down and when he was sort of almost almost finished covering the place the prince saw that and he said, oh, you really you really want this place you're really serious so then okay i will sell you uh, um, but i also want to make offering so it is said that the prince built this huge majestic gate uh, you know that through which you have to enter the dwelling of the buddha so anyway um so this is um how this place came to be and it was such an important place and um i think some early chinese master when they went went to india to study um which is like um a thousand year after buddha have passed away uh, they saw that it was still a very very um, how to say Mm, a bustling monastic community 
you know, people were studying, practicing, meditating monks, you know. Um, but then by the time Xuanzang, the great Chinese master, uh, he went there after 300 years, you know, so before him, another Chinese master went at that time, it was still, uh, you know, very much alive. But when Xuanzang was there, he said that it was, it was all in ruins. There wasn't much left of uh, this, um, yeah, such this important um, landmark, this important place. Anyway, so that is the place that he was staying there. And then it shows time. So time is easy, right? So when, when, when was it? When did you hear that? So now this, thus did I hear at one time. The person is uh, Ananda. You know, Ananda is the one who is saying it right now. So when did Ananda hear it? That um, it was um, during the time when the Buddha was in Anatha Pindata's park. <laughs> And so that is the, so it shows place, time, and teacher, the Buddha, of course, and the retinue, retinue of fully ordained monks. This is important. In the translation, we only have large monastic assembly, but in the Tibetan, uh, I, I see that there is Gyalongi Gindu Chimbudna. It's a, I'm not just a monastic Sangha, but um, it's a sangha of fully ordained monks. Mm -hmm. And so we have the um, disciples. And then the teaching. What is the teaching? The Bhagavan addressed the, monk, addressed the monks as follows. So this is the teaching that the Buddha gave. Um, I will just read it very quickly through the sutras in sutra in Tibetan uh, and th that will be the oral transmission. I have received the oral transmission from King Rinpoche uh, when he gave uh, the oral transmission of entire Buddha's teaching in Zongsar many years ago. So what oral transmission mean is that uh, this then becomes a lineage, an unbroken lineage of um, ear to mouth, you know? So first Buddha spoke and his student, who, whoever was there heard it and they related to the next, to the next, to the next. So until us, it was kept like this, sort of this type of um, yeah. Um, sort of, how to say, I think originally it was started because, uh, you know, um, the sutras, they were not written down. So the teachers had to recite it many, many times until this, the, the disciples memorize it completely. But we don't need that anymore, right? But still as a, as a sort of a stream of blessing, we continue it to this day. So I will read it. Jagar Keto, Anitita, Sutra, Pig, the Metabanichi, the Sanga, the Jesus, and Patam Jala Chasso, the Degata, the Tuchin, the Jum, then they knew the Jabuji, the Saku message, Kungarawa, and Gelon, the Jim with the Tabuji, the Shoot, the Tenet Jum, then the Jigelon, and the Kazawa Gelon, the Church, with the Danijin, and Hamjela, Duba, Wemba, Pamba, Hito, Angamara Gavarachawa, she counts and a Kelonta. Name me Banijin of the Duba, Wemba, Pamba, Hito, Angamara Gavarachawa, name me Bati, Tayan. Nay in the Galonta, name it, and the Meduba, me, but me, Pamba, you do me all, Umber, Gavarcha, Maimba, Galonta, and so did not tell the Duba, and the Pamba, you don't want Umber Gavarcha, and so tea, tie and Gawa in the Galonta, Gavan, it is Angela Meduba, me, but me, Pamba, you do me all, Umber Gavarcha, Maimba, Galonta, Jorban, it is Angela Duba, and the Pamba, you don't want Umber Gavarcha, Jorbati, tie, Guba in the Galonta. Guban is it until a meduba, me wimba, me pamba, you do me, or Lombar Gavara Chawa, my imba, or Gelonda, so on, is it until a duba, wimba, pamba, you don't want Lombar Gavara Chawa, so on, te tayan chiva, the Gelonda chivan. Didn't until a meduba, me wimba, me pamba, you do me, or Lombar Gavara Chawa, my imba, jumped in the Jitikazal, the Devra Shape, the Gay Sonet, the Beshea, the Gay Kazal, the Neme, Meta Lanso Tamain, Jorba Meta Sota Tamain, Joe Meta Gitch, Nin Juruna, 
This part is so important, the beginning part, where you are told where the Buddha was, um, in what time, um, you know, with whom, and what kind of teachings that he gave. Um, it um, teachers tell us that when you read these, you should really try to vividly visualize the 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 setup, this type of surrounding Shakyamuni Buddha in this forest, basically monastery dwelling, um, surrounded by fully ordained monks, you know, like that. <clears throat> Um, if you have um, any questions, uh, please um, type it uh, into the chat. You know, we somehow, it's, uh, this evening is not easy for us to um, have it any other ways. So you will have to type your question in and then we will see. So the topic is impermanence. That's easy unless you cannot read. It is called the Sutra of Impermanence or On Impermanence, Metapa um, <clears throat> um, And impermanence itself, it, you know, um, there are many layers of, or, or maybe I should, should say, maybe there are many depth of the understanding of impermanence. Here it's just, it's very, um, It is, it is an understanding of impermanence, but uh, not so subtle. You know, it's, it's what is very much visible to all humans, all worldly beings. So, um, <clears throat> um, namely, and, and, you know, impermanence of mind and body, um, these impermanence are also very physical, somewhat physical, not really, the, the changes within our mind, that impermanence, even not that, rather more um, physical, but extremely important for us. For ordinary beings, these are so important. Um, sickness and health, impermanence of sickness and health, impermanence of youth and old age, impermanence of wealth and poverty, and impermanence of um, life and death. So important for us. Um, just to go through the sutras first, um, Buddha says um, to, the, to the monks, he says, uh, monks, um, these four things, are um, appealing, singled out, considered valuable, pleasant and highly appreciated by worldly beings, since worldly beings. So what are those? What are those four? Good health, youth, prosperity and life. So Buddha goes into each of these by saying monks, good health is appealing. It's 
dukkha is appealing it's it's what we want it's what we really wish for um single doubt <clears throat> um single doubt meaning it's you know there are so many things in samsara that beings desire but um compared to many other things this is what they really these are what they really single out that they want then they they want to have now this is the translation those of you who can speak tibetan or understand tibetan this is the translation of wenpa so for now i'm not going to go into um any discussion of the translation so let's leave it at that you know so a single doubt the chose this word um, this term for that so um, for the purpose it's good so single doubt single doubt meaning that um, among all the objects of design this world these are what beings want most so they want good health um and it is also it's pangpa it's considered really valuable it's really precious for sentient beings for for ordinary worldly beings and it's um ito onwa it's something that they really like it's pleasant yeah we have translation here is present so it's something that they really like um ito onwa number gawar chaos number gawar and something that they really um, yeah appreciate yet buddha says however um, although sentient beings only want good health only want good health but what they get the end result of good health inevitably is sickness is pain is suffering and this is what they will get um health is basically not getting sick not <laughs> not not being sick right now that's all health is right so at some point that is inevitable and then buddha says um so beings want health but they don't want what comes with the health which is sickness they don't want that um so um sentient beings for sentient beings sickness is neither neither appealing nor is it single doubt they do not want it um nor is it considered valuable pleasant or highly appreciated by anyone so here anyone refers to only worldly beings so in this way um we have health and the same goes with youth sentient beings want to youth we all we you know human beings we want to be young we want to be you know young and strong and healthy um yet also we want to live long you know um so it is it is not possible the inevitable um des- destination of youth is old age you cannot remain young forever and this is also something that we do not want um we yeah uh jamkun tonkapa he said mm, it's just that old age it it creeps into our life so slowly that we do not notice he said if a 20 year old you know young person 18 20 year old boy or a girl is to experience old age within a day within a night you know like the, tomorrow morning they wake up they are extremely old he said they will commit suicide they can they will not be able to live with themselves so evidently it is something we really to mm, not want but we want to live long so here buddha shows the the futility 
of um, human want. You know, it, it's we want happiness. Yet, what we seek happiness in places that is bound to disappoint us, that is bound to give us suffering. So similarly, he says, oh, beings want prosperity, wealth, fame, all of these are prosperity, right? Friends, family, you know. But he says, mm, whatever that whatever that gathers has to disperse. Whatever that goes up has to come down. Whatever more things you have, more things you will lose. Right? So here, um, Buddha says again that although um, prosperity or wealth is something that the be, uh, ordinary beings really, really want, um, the inevitable end of prosperity or the inevitable dest destination of prosperity is <clears throat> the decline of it. And that they really do not want, that they really, really do not wish to have. And then the most important, I think, is the last one, life, life force. This this wish to exist, this really, really mm, fear of not existing anymore, you know, not, um, <clears throat> yeah. So he says, life is really, really precious to each beings, to each worldly beings, to each humans, it's extremely precious. And they really, um, do everything to gain life, to keep life, yet they forget that with life comes death. And that is something that they um, dread, that is really extremely frightening, unappealing, they do not want. Um, <clears throat> so the sutra itself is very short. Um, at the end, Buddha, he gives, he, um, he gives a summary of um, his teaching. Um, good health is impermanent, youth does not last, prosperity is impermanent, and life too does not last. How can beings afflicted as they are by impermanence take delight in desirable things like these? Mm. Here you can see <clears throat> um, in the last two lines, how can beings afflicted as they are by impermanence take delight in desirable things like this? This is the main sort of purpose of the Buddha of, uh, um, to be talking about impermanence and the suffering of impermanence so that the listeners understand that whatever that is impermanent is suffering, it's bringing suffering, it's bound to disintegrate and you cannot look for a lasting peace, lasting joy and happiness and contentment there. It's just not possible. <clears throat> um, This is the sutra itself. Now I will attempt to elaborate a little bit. And since this is such a short sutra, I also don't want to take a lot of your time. Um, we have five sessions. No, we have uh, four, four sutras in five sessions. So this is the first one. So, um, so um, first three sutras, each one has only one session each. And the fourth sutra is a bit long. Um, we, um, uh, so we will go, we will attempt to go through that sutra, the rice seedling sutra in two sessions. 
So before I continue, I would like to um, take a just very short break, if it is possible, you know, just say two, three minutes. See you. <clears throat> so the teachings of impermanence it is really um, such a vast subject 
And it is not just, a, you know, when we say the teaching of impermanence it may even sound like it is something that Shakyamuni Buddha came up with. It really wasn't like that. It really isn't as we know. This is the reality. This is just how things are. <clears throat> um, when we do not understand impermanence, then there is no understanding of life after death. There is no understanding of cause and effect. There is no understanding of suffering, actually, from the Four Noble Truth. There is no understanding of the four seals. Um, there is no understanding of emptiness, selflessness. So impermanence is such an important pillar of um, Buddhist practice. <clears throat> such an important contemplation on impermanence is such an important um, essential, I should say, element of um, path. If you remember Shakyamuni Buddha himself, Prince Siddhartha himself, you know, um, you know, although before Siddhartha left, there have been many instances where Siddhartha would enter into meditation and or display <clears throat> unconditional love and care for others and so on. But what really spurred him on, what really, what was the tipping sort of point in his life that really made him seek enlightenment was him seeing this just this, this impermanence that the young prince, you know, as you know, as you remember, you know, young prince one day saw a dead body and he couldn't believe what that is, you know, and because he has been so sheltered, but when he saw that for the first time to be so close to something that is so inevitable, something that is all of our destiny. He just couldn't, um, it, it left a big impact on his mind. Then he saw old age and sickness, right? And during other times. That really sort of churned him from within and it really bad the reality of our life and he couldn't understand if we are all subject to old age sickness and death you know why do we live the way we do what is what is the purpose of all this you know are we are we nothing more than just beings that is that are just surviving that are just you know, day by day to day, that's all, you know. Um, so then he sees a monk, that is his answer. He sees an, a monk who is peacefully in dhyana, in meditation, and he sees that, and he knew that is it, that is my answer. That's what I have to do, right? So the beginning of our existence, our spiritual existence starts with, starts with this teaching actually, you know, starts with Buddha seeing not a profound sort of, you know, emptiness, you know, the prince, not like the prince understood emptiness or what is it, very, very subtle impermanence, not at all, with just this, that the prince saw death, the prince saw sickness and old age and he just it yeah we also see that but we don't have merit enough to to have these realities impact us the way it did him so that you know impermanence impermanence is what opened um the door of such possibilities to the prince <clears throat> 
So, <clears throat> so the friends left and persevered for so long, diligently practicing for so long. Um, they say for almost six years, hardly eating, drinking, or sleeping, you know, the prince one pointedly sought enlightenment and he found enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. Now, since impermanence is such a important part of our existence, you, you may say the impermanence is our existence. So obviously, in most of the Buddha's teaching, impermanence is taught. In most of the sutra, in so many different sutra, Buddha have taught impermanence. Impermanence has always taken such um, an important role in the teachings of the Buddha. <coughs> Whereby Shakyamuni Buddha says, those who contemplate on impermanence, then they are making offerings to the Buddha. Metaba Samane Sangeji Chinjila Bayuno. Those who are contemplating on impermanence, they are blessed by the Buddhas. Metaba Samane Sangeji Lungtem Bayuno. Those who contemplate on impermanence, they are prophesied by the Buddha to become future Buddha without any doubt. Um, within his teaching, uh, for example, one of the most important teaching of the Buddha is the four seals. So the first seal is the seal of impermanence. So if you do not understand seal of impermanence, you are not going to understand the rest of the seal. So all compounded phenomena are impermanent. So this is extremely important. Then, Four Noble Truth, right? This is another important teachings of Buddha. The truth of suffering, you know, first one. Um, when explaining, so what, is, what is it? What is the truth of suffering? Um, Buddha and the Indian masters, they say, oh, the truth of suffering itself can be explained as metak dungal tong dame, as impermanence, suffering, um, emptiness, and selflessness. So, the, again, what did, what did Buddha meant by um, this is suffering? Or, know this, know the suffering, you know, know the suffering when he taught the teaching of the Four Noble Truth. What is, the, what is the suffering? The suffering is the, imp is the impermanence. This is the suffering. Um, so yeah, in this and many other ways, Buddha again and again and again, um, you know, have taught that understanding of impermanence, contemplation of impermanence, meditation, realization of impermanence is extremely crucial. It's very, very important on the part. Even during his last teaching, you know, when the Buddha is passing away, he gives the teaching of impermanence. You know, he tells the monks and those who are gathered there, look at the body of Tathagata. You will not see this again. You know, and then he goes on to uh, teach about the impermanence of all phenomena. So, in Buddha's own life, the teaching of impermanence has always been important, extremely important. Um, now, practically, for us, what does it mean for us? <laughs> Mm. Shaktamani Buddha teaches that sentient beings are in samsara. So this is samsara. We are sentient beings. So why 
are sentient beings in samsara. What is the cause of samsara? He says, oh, there are, so, oh, the main cause of samsara is ignorance. So what is this ignorance? He says, there are four types of ignorance. First is the ignorance of permanence. Hmm. Again, see? So the first is the ignorance of permanence. Thinking impermanent things as permanent. This is the first ignorance. Then the second type of ignorance, uh, what is it? Metapala mm. mm. Then the second type of ignorance is looking at phenomena that is suffering in their nature as joy, as happiness. So this is the second type of ignorance. Third type of ignorance is looking at phenomena that are impure in nature, that are not good in their nature but looking at them and thinking that they are good, they are pure, they are clean, third type of ignorance. Fourth type of ignorance is looking at phenomena that does not have a self, truly existing self, and thinking that, ah, there is a self. With these four types of ignorance, sentient beings are bound to samsara. Um, You don't have to look far away. If you are a sentient being like me, you can see in yourself all of these four. And the first one, which really, really brings so much suffering in our life is looking at an impermanent phenomena and hoping it to be permanent, hoping, thinking that it is permanent. Having this ignorance makes us suffer a lot. Um, so, until and unless these type of these four types of ignorances are removed from sentient beings, there is no nirvana. There is no liberation. Now, the aim of the enlightened being, the aim of the Buddha, is to liberate sentient beings. So one of the most, so how to say, all the teachings of the Buddha is geared towards removing these four ignorance. And this one in particular is geared towards removing the first ignorance, the ignorance of permanence. Because we have ignorance of permanence, you know, you and I, we could, we could, we could practice day and night. We could dedicate everything to enlightenment, but we don't, you know, we could theoretically just live like Siddhartha, just, you know, <laughs> you know, um, what is it? You know, renunciate everything. We could theoretically, but we won't, we don't. Why? Because, you know, um, because of, yeah, our, mm, of course, because of so many reasons, but I, one important reason is because of our attachment to permanence, our attachment to permanence. We don't want things to change. We think things won't change and we are comfortable with that. And this creates a false sense of security. This really makes us feel safe and think that there is there is still a lot of time. There is definitely a lot of time in future. Oh, a lot of opportunity. And these four, sick, you know, um, sickness, um, old age, um, um, what is it? What was that? Um, poverty um, or decline or prosperity and death. They are really, they will come no matter what, and especially death. If you cannot, if, if the rest of these three, it doesn't stuck you so much, at least contemplate on death, contemplate on death. It's so, it's such a,
such a strong statement of the phenomena themselves is such a cruel thing, you know, yet we ignore it, yet we, yet we, you know, <laughs> always think nobody here, I'm sure none of us think you will die tonight. I'm sure none of, if, if you think you will think at least this week, I don't see myself dying, you know, like or this month, we're always pushing, um, you know, uh, and, and nobody tells, nobody told us that, nobody gave us this guarantee. Yet we just have, we feel like we have this guarantee. And that is the cruelness of impermanence of death. Nobody prepares you, nobody tells you, it comes suddenly and changes everything. So, Mm. For a practitioner, impermanence is extremely important to, you know, for contemplation. You have to contemplate on impermanence, especially lazy, sort of, you know, really, really mm, low self-confidence beings like us. We really, really need to co contemplate on impermanence. We really need it. You know, we won't. We all know that. Most of us won't. But we really need it. Impermanence is one of the greatest teachers. Um, as Milarepa said many times, impermanence is really... Um, yeah, so for a practitioner who wants to see ultimate reality, you have to, you, you have to contemplate on impermanence. If you don't, this sense of stability, sense of permanence and you know, just um, false sense of safety will ruin us. It is ruining me right now. You know, as we talk, I have received teachings now, really profound teachings. for 15, 20 years now, you know? And if I would have started really seriously practicing for back then, by now, wow, something has to have happened. Transformation must have happened, but nothing, nothing. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like a breeze in a desert, you know? <laughs> After a while, you don't see any, any, um, <laughs> any trace. It's gone. Like throwing a stone in the water, it just make a bloop and it's gone. <laughs> That's really bad. So, um, so whether we laugh about it or cry about it, mm, at some point, mm, either these four will come together or one by one, but especially the last one, death it has to strike this warm body that we have, you know, um, breathing <clears throat> alive phenomena that we have. One day it will be cold and it will become a garbage for our family. And they have to get rid of it. And that's just how it is. And what will happen after that? Who knows? utter darkness for us. So for a practitioner, we really, really need to contemplate on impermanence. So um, for the Bodhisattva project participants here, so your homework is to contemplate on impermanence. Um, so the next teaching is on April 3rd. So until then, so today is the March 18th. So until April 3rd, 
your work is that you have to, you know, contemplate on impermanence for um, at least, <laughs> at least three hours. How you do it up to you. You can read about impermanence. You can meditate about on impermanence. You can listen about the impermanence or you write about impermanence. But now those for the Bodhisattva Project trainees I'm talking, huh? others can participate if they want. Really, more, well, more the better. Really, we are really happy if you would. Um, but you have to give me a time lock with your name. And you, you have to say like on, on the 19th March, during 7 p.m. till what, what, like 7.15, while sitting on my toilet, I thought of impermanence for 15 minutes, you know, like that. Please do that. Buddha said, uh, Buddha asks, you know, monks, he says, if you, if you, if someone would feed, give food, you know, to, Arahats like Sariputra and Mongolianaputra for a hundred years, day and night, every day serving. You know, it will gain an immense merit. Yet this merit is nothing compared to when someone contemplates on impermanence for a moment. This merit is far superior. Yes, this is what we need. I will also do that, by the way. So we do it together. Um, yeah. What else to say? Already one and a half hour. Now, impermanence, again, it's, it's, it's not to make us, it's not only to, you know, of course, it is to make us aware of what is happening aware of our reality that everything is changing everything is just you know hundred thousands of cause and effect is running through us all the time so anything in any way can happen you know that is important now initially it will generate a um, bit of fear it will generate a uh, sense of urgency but our teacher tells us that if you those who really contemplate on impermanence those who really practice the meditation of impermanence or oh, such a person will not be fooled by appearance of samsara such a person will not be swayed by attachment and anger and arrogance and these phenomena these experience they will come, they will go. Meditator of impermanence will not be swayed. Important. Kinsan Rinpoche says, those who contemplate on in impermanence um, is like a skilled general who know, who, who have thought very thoroughly, you know, laid out the battle plan and thought very thoroughly about, oh, possible scenarios and now completely relaxed in contemplation of impermanence will mm, make us diligent wow this is one thing that we need diligence we really need diligence what you know modern people among all the things we need diligence really really diligence to be, what is diligence? To ignore distraction and focus <laughs> on, on, uh, on the practice. We really need that. Impermanence, contemplation on that will do that. It will give us confidence. And most importantly, it will really instill deep devotion towards the Buddha. Wow, you know, these things that we learn, we take for granted. Do you think you would figure it out by yourself if Buddha wouldn't have taught? 
I don't, I really don't, you know. Just the kindness alone of this Indian man to have said all compounded things are impermanent. How are we ever going to repay that kindness? It will generate devotion. It will generate compassion. It will really, from, from an ordinary being till an enlightened being, whatever that is there in the between, everything will come through contemplation of impermanence. So we should really do that. I really pray and make aspiration to be able to do that. I cannot now. We have to accept our situation right now. We have to be practical, honest, but that's where we have to go. And you know what to do. We have to do that. Our lineage masters have done that. Um, there is no other way, you know, and in the end, as the Buddha said, Sisum meta tongi tinta da joe kichi karla tada son kewe tseso namke lo jo reserve bhakchu shindu nyur jo bros. Sisum meta tongi tinta das. The whole world is impermanent like um, um, like clouds in autumn sky. Sisum meta tongi tinta da. Joe kichi karla tada son. Watching birth and death of sentient beings is like watching a theater dance of actors changing their costumes changing their mask and expressions life of sentient beings are as mm, volatile and fickle fast as a lightning and life of sentient beings, you know, it slips from our hand continuously, like a continuous flow of a waterfall. Yes, this may also help this type of um, shlokas from Buddha's teaching. You could just contemplate everything changing continuously, uninterruptedly, like a waterfall. Yeah. Wow, there's just so many factors, but I just stop here today. I don't want to overload you. Is there, are there any questions? Oh, yeah, let me. Um, Eva asked, do we still know where is this Jetta grow? I'm sure we, I'm sure now uh, in India, um, you know, you can find it. The British, um, they, when they came to India, um, they found many places important Buddhist pilgrimage sites. Uh, and they referred a lot to the book of um, the great Xuanzang, the Chinese master. He had, he had detailed record of uh, wherever he went, you know, so that was very good. <clears throat> Eva asked, I remember when I heard about impermanence and then that there are more life reincarnation of income to this, what is it? Thought came when I am desperate to realize if something seems to be very difficult, I think, okay, maybe I can realize in next life. How can I come out of this disturbing thought? Well, that is one way to go. I mean, if you're going to be lazy, you can, you know, 
throw it to your next um, rebirth. But um, as Shanti Deva says, if you do not try to accomplish in this life and you leave it, then um, out of habit in next life too, you are very much likely to do the same thing and think, ah, oh, so difficult. I do this and again some other life and again some other life. And this will take a long time. I, I really understand this, especially if you are someone, if we are, you know, if you are someone who is very, very sick or very, very old, let's say, you, you feel very old, let's say, and you feel like, oh, in this life, you know, I cannot do it. Mm, then, I mean, yes, you should make aspirations, you know, that either in this life, if I cannot do in this life, in next life, for sure may I be able to do it. But that doesn't mean that you do not make any effort at all in this life. You should also make effort in this life. Yeah. Luciana F. Marquis asks, what does it mean realizing permanence? Yes, that's a good question. Now, um, realizing impermanence is getting accustomed to impermanence completely that thought of permanence cannot enter you. That you really, mm, what is a good example? Wow, um, during the, okay, during the time of Buddha, now this again becomes a long story, wait. Okay, during the time of Buddha, um, Buddha tells, Buddha tells the monks that um, among all of my students, this family, there is a family with a father and a mother and a daughter and a son. He says, this family, they have understood impermanence among all of my students. So the monks, they wanted to test this family. You know, so what they do is that, that they kidnap the boy. They kidnap the boy and, and they go to each of the family members and tell them, oh, you know, your son, he goes to the mother, your son is dead. You know, and the mother, um, ordinarily you will cry and pull your hair, do whatever the parents will do. That's a horrible, it's a painful thing. But the mother says, well, you know, <laughs> we are all gathered in this life, like birds gathered on a tree. Birds gather together during nightfall on one tree. In the morning, each goes their separate ways. You know, I did not, due to karma, he was born as my son, but I did not ask him to come and I did not tell him to go. He did not ask me if he could come. He didn't tell me now that he's going. So such are the nature of phenomena. You know, the monks are puzzled. They go, they go to the father. He also gives similar example like, oh, well, you know, we are all like, um, what is it? Um, mm, travelers gathered in a, in a, in a, in a, in, you know, in a, in a, I don't know, do I say hotel, you know? Uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't plan this. It causes and condition make it happen. Causes and condition take it away, you know, like that. And they go to the daughter, the sister, she says the same thing. That you can say is they have realized impermanence. Really thoroughly that nothing can scare you, nothing can intimidate you. You are free in true sense. Then Emilia asks, Ah yeah, what is the reason? Prosperity was added to 
the rest three, old age, sickness, and death in this sutra because Siddhartha saw old age, sickness, and death and left. So why prosperity? Well, um, because Siddhartha already, already had prosperity, you know, so, so he didn't have to see prosperity outside, right? Um, but um, this, this is for, this is, this is meant for those monks and those followers, people like us, you know, we believe that Buddha is omniscient. That means when he was giving this sutra, he knew about us. He knew that on 18th March, <laughs> 7.30 PM on Zoom, what is it? Twen in, a, in a strange way of counting the year, 2022, you and me will gather here virtually and go through this sutra. He is omniscient. He has to know. So this is, these four are what ordinary beings want. In, in the English translation, I thought, I don't know why they did that. I don't want to go into it, but they they have written everyone, everyone or everybody, something like that, right? What is it now? Where is it? Yeah. Um, yeah, monks. A life is appealing, singled out, considered valuable, pleasant, and highly appreciated by everyone. This is a bit misleading, I, I think. I, I don't know what their explanations are, but in the Tibetan sutra, in the, in the sutra it says, worldly beings, jikten pe you know, worldly, worldly beings want these four things. Not everyone, arhats don't, Buddha don't, Bodhisattvas don't, right? Um, yeah, so that. What else? Right. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for participating. Thank you to the translators for translating and Rebecca for organizing this. And we still have a couple of more sessions to go. And um, you know, I would like to believe that we have accumulated a lot of merit a lot of merit and I believe that the amount of this merit, the intensity, mm, it is of an um, unstoppable nature. So we should dedicate, I really hope you dedicate the merit for the longevity of Buddha Dharma, for the longevity of um, great masters, holder of Dharma, holder of teachings, holder of um, practice. And you know what? For the longevity of good men and women everywhere, you know, <laughs> for, for, for more rebirth of good men and women in this earth. Just use your merit like a magnet and pray that from all different kinds of world, good, kind, honest, just, strong men and women will be born on this earth everywhere. We need that. We really, really need that. That's all. Thank you very much. And yeah, maybe see you next time. Don't forget the homework, you know, those Bodhisattva project people, especially there from BP2. Um, yes, you can send your, what is it? 
um, report to Rebecca. <laughs> oh, so nam di tamje zibanye to me nye beta nam pamje di chegan na je balon chubaye si be so lendo ando war show. Chang ju sen ju dun bo je ma je ba nam je ba na je ba nyam ba me ba yang kong ne kong do tel war show. Jambal ba wo jidar chen ba na kundo zambo te yang de jin de te da kung ji jizu da lo jin ge wa de da tamje rap to um. May I, in all my lives, carry far the weight of Buddha Dhamma. And if I am not capable to do so, may I always be worried about the longevity of Dharma. Right. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>